Hello and welcome back to this course on mathematical symmetry. Last week we asked the question, what is a symmetry? We decided that it was a transformation which left a shape or pattern looking the same. The types of transformations which we were interested in are isometries of the Euclidean plane. These are transformations of the plane which don't change the distances between points. Examples we saw last time were the simple but important identity transformation, which just leaves every point where it is, as well as translations, reflections, rotations, and glide reflections. If you tried the bonus exercises last time, you actually proved that all isometries of the Euclidean plane fall into one of these categories. If you have a shape, and two symmetries of the shape, that is, two isometries of the plane which leave the shape looking the same, then doing one followed by the other is still overall an isometry because the distances between points don't change. And it also leaves the shape looking the same. Therefore, we can combine symmetries to get new symmetries. Here, for example, is a reflection followed by a rotation and it's the same as doing another reflection. This led us to thinking about groups of symmetries of shapes. The group of symmetries of a shape is simply the collection of all symmetries of that shape. All groups of symmetries share the following properties. They contain the identity. You can combine any two symmetries to get another symmetry in the collection. And every symmetry has an inverse, another symmetry which reverses its effects. For the square, Albert showed us that the group of symmetries contains eight transformations. The identity, three rotations, and four reflections. We also saw that we can write all of the symmetries as combinations of just two symmetries, a reflection F and a rotation R. We said that the group of symmetries is therefore generated by F and R. More generally, since we know from the definition of a group of symmetries that it must contain the inverses of all elements and all combinations of elements, we say that a symmetry group is generated by a set of symmetries if every symmetry in the group can be formed using different combinations of those symmetries and their inverses. This week, we are going to continue looking at groups of symmetries in the plane, but instead of looking at shapes, we will look at patterns, designs which cover the whole plane. In other words, tessellations or tilings of the plane. In this video, I shall work through an example of how to find the group of symmetries of a tessellation in detail. In the next two videos, Albert will talk about how we can analyze the symmetries of these patterns. And by looking at the group of symmetries, he will actually find every single tessellation of the plane. First, let's be clear about what we mean by a tiling or tessellation. We are talking about a periodically repeating pattern which fills up the whole plane. The simplest repeating unit of the pattern can be thought of as something like a bathroom wall tile. You just need lots of copies of the tile and to know how the tiles fit together and you can cover the whole wall. Mathematicians call the tile a fundamental domain and Albert is going to talk about these in the next video. Since the patterns repeat, they will have non-trivial symmetries. The group of symmetries of such a tiling in effect gives you the instructions on how to arrange the tiles to form the pattern. There are examples of so-called aperiodic tilings, patterns which completely cover the plane using copies of the same tiles laid down following a set of rules, but which don't ever repeat themselves. The most famous example of such an aperiodic tiling is the Penrose tiling, which is a fascinating pattern with lots of interesting maths behind it, but which is not the subject of this course. Let's look at an example. You may recognize this pattern. It's called hound's tooth and is used in a lot of textile design and fashion. The earliest example of its use turns out to be around 200 BCE. 
Notice that I've only shown a finite portion of the pattern, because there's only a finite amount of space on the screen, but you have to imagine that it extends out infinitely in every direction. Let's try and find the symmetries of this pattern. There are clearly going to be infinitely many. For example, the pattern is symmetric under reflection along this line, but also this one, this one, and all of these others. Therefore, we will have to find a compact way to express all of the symmetries in one go. Firstly, we can identify all of the different types of symmetries. We've already spotted an infinite family of reflectional symmetries, and the identity, of course, is also a symmetry. There are also infinitely many translational symmetries. In fact, we can translate diagonally in two directions, as well as horizontally and vertically. There are other translations at other strange angles as well, like this. What about rotations? It doesn't look like there are any, and you can convince yourself of this by just looking at one of the black shapes on its own. It has no rotational symmetries, and neither does the overall pattern. There are certainly glide reflections which come from combining one of the reflections we've already found with one of the vertical translations, but there are other glide reflections along lines parallel to the reflection lines. That's a bit of a mess. How can we simplify matters? The answer is to look back to last time, when we were thinking about generators of groups. For the square, we found that just two symmetries were enough for us to get all eight symmetries. For this tiling, it turns out rather remarkably that again just two symmetries are enough to generate all of the infinitely many symmetries. How is this possible, you may ask? Let's start with the translations. We can find the simplest translation up and right and call it T1. Doing T1 over and over, we can get all the possible translations up and to the right. T1 followed by T1, or T1 squared, gives the translation up and right by twice the distance of T1. T1 cubed gives the translation up and right by three times the distance, and so on. Now, going back to the definition of a group of symmetries, we know that every symmetry must have an inverse which is also in the group of symmetries. Therefore, we get the inverse of T1, which we can write as T1 to the power minus 1, for free. What symmetry undoes a translation up and right? Well, a translation down and left by the same distance, of course. With this, we can now get every possible translation down and left. We're now stuck, because we can't get any more symmetries just using T1. Let's add in T2 as the simplest translation up and left. Just as with T1, T2 on its own gives us every possible translation up and left, as well as down and right. If we combine T1 and T2, we can also get the vertical and horizontal translations. T1 followed by T2 is the simplest translation up. T1 followed by T2 inverse is the simplest translation to the right. We can even get the translations at strange angles by combining the T1s and T2s in different ratios. Just like that, we've got all of the translational symmetries just using two of the simplest ones. What about the reflections? We can't get reflections by combining translations. So let's add in one of the reflections and call it F, short for flip. Can we get the other reflections using F and the translations? Surprisingly, yes we can. In fact, there are several ways to do it. To get the reflection along this line, for example, first translate so that the line matches the reflection line for F, then do F, and finally translate the line back to where it started. Overall, this is the same as just doing a reflection in the line. In a similar way, you can get all of the reflections by doing a suitable translation, the reflection in F, and then translating back. 
The only other symmetries to worry about are the glide reflections. The glide reflections, which are just combinations of translations and reflections which we've already made using T1, T2 and F, are already dealt with. But the other glide reflections along lines parallel to the reflection lines cannot be made using just the translations and reflections. Call the glide reflection along this line with the smallest translation distance upwards, G. Just as with the translations T1 and T2, G and its inverse generate all glide reflections along this line. We can then play the same trick we did with the reflections to get all possible glide reflections using just the translations and G. Now we have all of the symmetries, there are no others. This means that the group of symmetries of the houndstooth tiling is generated by just four symmetries, T1, T2, F and G. Actually we can do even better. We can get both the translation T1 and the translation T2 just using the reflection F and the glide reflection G. Let me colour in one of the white shapes so that we can keep track of it. If we do the reflection first, followed by the glide reflection, we get a translation up and right, or in other words, R followed by F is T1. If we do the glide reflection first, followed by the reflection, this gives a translation up and left, which means that F followed by R is T2. So every symmetry of the pattern can be made using T1, T2, F and G, and T1 and T2 can in turn be made using just F and G. Therefore, we can make every symmetry in the group using just F and G. They are generators for the group of symmetries. There's a succinct way to write this. Mathematicians use angled brackets to indicate the group of symmetries generated by certain isometries. So the group of symmetries of the houndstooth pattern is written like this. In the next video, Albert will show you how you can go from a generating set like this to finding a fundamental domain, that is, a simplest possible repeating unit, and use this to analyse the pattern and symmetry group further. That's it for this video. Check out the exercises where you have the chance to find the symmetry groups for other tilings, and think about finding generating sets for these groups. This will be very helpful for Albert's next video.